Greetings, humanoids and earthlings. Welcome, Adam and Akbar. It's a new module in our course on ethics and science. We're looking at research with human subjects. In this lecture, we're going to kind of do a, an overview to complement uh, the textbook assignment and talk a little bit about the other uh, article that I signed for you this week. So let us get into it. What I want to do today is talk a bit about uh, this theme we actually brought up a couple lectures ago of extending ethics beyond just RCR and the F FP framework that we learned so much about. Then a new feature, Akbar goes to the movies. And then a little bit of history, uh, some ethical takeaways from this, a focus on the US briefly, uh, and then a few case studies to wrap up. Um, we're gonna talk about the Tuskegee study a little bit here, but that's coming up next week. We'll have a more in-depth look at that, as well as uh, research with human subjects when it comes to indigenous populations. So again, this is a really big subject and other people may give more time to this in a course on ethics and science. I certainly recognize that we're only gonna be able to kind of touch some of the basics, but let's do what we can. All right, remember from a couple lectures ago, I talked about how the as, as important as the RCR framework is in, in terms of defining what responsible conduct of research looks like. And that means not fabrication, not falsification, not plagiarism. That that's not enough, right? That's the case I was making. And we even brought up this experiment to this like thought experiment about a cancer researcher. I don't know if you remember that. But here we are again. Now we, we need to extend the ethics of science beyond just the FFP framework. Um, so imagine a researcher goes into a prison and takes prisoners against their will and enrolls them in uh, some sort of clinical trial that they're doing, injecting something into their bodies or who knows what. But they're not fabricating anything. They're not falsifying anything. They give everybody due credit so there's no plagiarism. Clearly though, that wouldn't be responsible research, right? But sadly though, things like this have happened in the history of the world and of the US. And so there has been a long and ongoing conversation about broadening the ethics of research to contexts where human subjects are involved. What does the ethics of that look like? And so that's kind of what we are looking at now in this module. Now, Akbar goes to the movies. Uh, I don't know if anybody's seen this film. I don't recommend it actually. Uh, it's got a 56% on Rotten Tomatoes. I think that's well-deserved. It's not the best movie in my humble estimation. Extreme Measures, 96 film with Gene Hackman, Hugh, uh, Hugh Grant, got that right. A little bit of back, back story here and then I'm gonna try to toggle over and show you a two minute clip that's on YouTube. Uh, so Hackman, is a medical uh, physician, but also a scientist doing these experiments on homeless people that he just takes off of the street against their will in search of a cure for paralysis. This is based on a book, by the way. Well, Grant finds this out. He's a, a, one of his medical colleagues and he confronts him in this scene. So this is a scene where Hugh Grant has just found out that Hackman is doing these sort of shady, uh, research on human subjects without their consent, right? What you have here, and it's a bit contrived, that's maybe part of the problem with the movie, is this age-old debate between utilitarianism and the person of Hackman, the scientist doing the experiments, and deontology and the person of Grant, the one confronting him and saying that's not the right thing to do. Utilitarianism, in this case, saying, look, you could sacrifice the few to help the many. That would be the right thing to do. And the deontologist saying, although in this clip that I've got, Hugh Grant is just listening mostly. Um, but I think his response would be some things are immoral, irrespective of the consequences. So some things you just don't do because humans say have intrinsic value or worth. What I want you to keep in mind, and we're gonna talk a little over here. Uh, Akbar, you help me out. We're gonna do a new share. Keep in mind here, uh, as you listen to Hackman, whether 
you're convinced or not by what he's saying. So I think I shared this with computer sound. Let's hope this works. Okay, here we go. I'm 68 years old. I don't have much time. Three years with a rat to get to a dog. And after five years, if I'm lucky, maybe I can work on a chimp. We have to move faster than that. I'm doing medicine here no one's ever dreamed of. This is baseline neurochemistry, guy. You're killing people. People die every day. For what? For nothing. Plane crash, train wreck. Bosnia, pick your tragedy. Sniper in a restaurant. 15 dead, story at 11. What do we do? What do you do? You change the channel, you move on to the next patient. You take care of the ones you think you can save. Good doctors do the correct thing. Great doctors have the guts to do the right thing. Your father had those guts. So do you. Two patients on either side of the room, one a gold shield cop, the other a maniac that pulled a gun on a city bus. Who do you work on first? You knew, guy. You knew. If you could cure cancer by killing one person, wouldn't you have to do that? Wouldn't that be the brave thing to do? One person and cancer's gone tomorrow. You thought you were paralyzed. What would you have done to be able to walk again? Anything. You said it yourself. Anything. You were like that for 24 hours. Helen hasn't walked for 12 years. I can cure her. And everyone like her. The door's open. You can go out there and put a stop to everything and it'll all be over. But we can go upstairs and change medicine forever. It's your call, guy. Okay, hold on, let that go too long. Help me out, Akbar. Okay, let's see if this can be made to work. Go back here. Uh, oh boy. Okay, <laughs> we'll see if that works. Uh, that's really high tech for me. Akbar's doing his best. Um, one thing also to note in that clip, I think is really interesting, the opening, like take sci good science takes too long. In fact, ethical science, quote unquote, is actually unethical because it makes them go through all of these hoops and hurdles and red tape. And meanwhile, people are suffering. And if we could speed up the process, maybe by cutting some corners here or there, we would help people. And so therefore we'd be doing better. We'd be doing more good. Okay, that's Akbar goes to the movies. Now, get back to this. Um, a little bit of a brief history. Uh, and what I'm doing is just kind of glossing over what's in the textbook. textbook. So ultimately, the reason we're talking about this is because humans have to furnish knowledge about humans. So you want to try a vaccine out. You can do all you want with the computers. You can do all you want with animal studies. But at some point, it's got to go into somebody's body and you're running an experiment on a human subject. Right? So that's why we're talking about this. Keep that in mind, because Akbar has something to say at the very end about that. In the pre-modern period, huge stretch of time, we've talked about this before, science or natural philosophy was primarily limited to observation. There wasn't a lot of intervention in the natural world, including the natural human body. This started to change with the Renaissance. An interest in experimentation arose this is extremely controversial all the way into the 19th century. Like grave diggers digging up bodies to study how the human body works was 
widely considered to be sacrilegious, sinful, wrong. So again, religion and science sharing these roots uh, as they work together and sometimes in opposition. Into the 19th century, one of the things I find most interesting is this era, which still continues today to some extent, although it's diminished, this era of medical self-experimentation by researchers. You know, if you ask, who is it that should risk their own well-being in the name of scientific progress through experimentation, you can make a strong case that it's the scientists themselves who should take those risks first. And there is a tradition of scientists doing that. On into the 20th century, you have the increasing use of experimentation on human subjects. It gets more and more widespread. But guess what? Surprise, surprise to those of you who know your history, it's poor people. It's people of color, slaves, marginalized, vulnerable people who tend to get used as the experimental subjects. That now over the last hundred years or so, we've been trying to fix that, right? Trying to do better. And I do think it's been a story of progress, ethical progress. A lot of interesting things in the 21st century. I've been making the case that we're all guinea pigs in a way. We're all human subjects of a grand techno-scientific experiment. Facebook and social media is a good example where, you know, if you don't have to buy a product, that means you are the product, right? So all this free stuff in a way isn't free because they are collecting data from you. When you collect data, that's a form of experimentation. Right? They're using that data then. So the ethics of social media data use I think is fascinating and it's on the cutting edge of this area we're talking about in this module. Okay, by the way, when we wrote the textbook, me and Carl, I hate to say it sound old, but man, this stuff wasn't on the horizon at all. You know, social media and data uh, usage, but now it's so important. Okay, a little bit on the ethics of this again, I'm just sort of complimenting what's in that, what's in the chapter in the textbook. Key distinction here, research versus therapy. Therapy describes an intervention or an act that is for the patient's benefit. Whoever is getting the therapy, they're getting it because it's, it, it's for them. It should be for their own good. Research, though, primarily, is not for the research subject's benefit. The research subject is being used in an experiment, hopefully to benefit somebody else down the line. Right? That's a key distinction. Sometimes it's blurred, like in these human challenge trials that you read about, but that distinction generally is a good one to hold on to. Now, <clears throat> one of the key things we point into the text, probably the most important historical marker for the ethics of research with human subjects is the Nuremberg trial and the Nuremberg code. Do you remember that higher standard from our section on ethics that we have to look at not just laws, but what is a just law, not just what is legal, but whether what is legal is right. So all of the things done by Nazi physicians and scientists in concentration camps in terms of human experimentation, just because it was legal in Nazi Germany doesn't mean it was the right thing to do. So the Nuremberg trial was this international tribunal looking for some higher standard by which to judge what they were doing. And one of the things that came out of this was this Nuremberg Code. In the first line talks about how the free and informed consent of the individual is absolutely vital and foundational for any form of research with human subjects. Free and informed consent. And why is that? Because underneath of that is a picture of the human as an autonomous subject, a self-legislating person who has intrinsic value and is in charge of their self and they can't just be used as like a tool or as an instrument in somebody else's scheme. You don't get just to use a person. That's not what a person is, right? So there's this commitment to a, a picture of what it means to be human. Okay, a little bit in the US context. Again, we'll talk about the Tuskegee syphilis more coming up. So just a note on it, this was 399. African-American sharecroppers in Alabama for 40 years, from 32 to 70, 1932 to 1972, they 
were treated in an experiment where they, they weren't even told what was going on, but the US government scientists were allowing syphilis to progress unchecked, even after penicillin was proven to be an effective treatment. They, were, they withheld the treatment from them. Now this came out thanks to some muckraking journalism and some whistleblowing, and it made big news and it sparked Congress to act one of the things they did is, is create a commission on bioethics that came up with this Belmont report. This is in your textbook of 1976. And they laid out this framework, which has ever since sort of guided the ethics of research with human subjects. And there's really three main guiding principles here. Respect for persons, which again, is grounded in this notion that we are autonomous, self-legislating beings. We can't just be used like a tool and it's cashed out in actions of informed consent, free and informed consent. You have to give your okay to somebody doing something to you. Beneficence, that is weighing the risks and benefits of whatever experiment it is that you're doing. If it's super risky and it's only something to treat hangnails, right, or something that doesn't have a whole lot of benefit to it, well, then the bar would have to be very high for you to, to clear. If it's a low risk, but it could have a high benefit, right? Well, then that changes the moral calculation. The last one, justice, in terms of particularly the, um, oh, I think I have a, I've got one more thing here. Actually, I have a picture. This is a picture from the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. Justice in terms of the selection of research participants. This is super important because you'll often get people being exposed to the risks of the development of a drug or vaccine, but not then getting the benefits of that research, right? And you also need to have a diverse range of people enrolled in these medical studies to be sure that you are testing it against all sorts of different human physiologies, right? So how do we achieve justice in terms of who's involved bearing the risks and also getting the benefits? Now, Last thing to say in the US context, and this is just the 30,000 foot overview, overview, right? Institutional review boards, IRBs. Boy, you better walk out of this class knowing something about IRBs. And really all you have to know is that this is a decentralized network for ethical oversight of research proposals. So anywhere you've got research with human subjects going on, that is to say like any university, like the University of North Texas, we have our own IRB. And if anybody at UNT wants to do research involving human subjects, they have to get a proposal into the IRB. The IRB has to look at it. They're going to assess it based on these principles, right? And they're gonna either give it the okay or the not okay. So there's no like central federal agency that manages all of this. It's decentralized. Every institution is applying these principles to all of the research proposals that might involve human subjects, okay? Okay, last thing I wanna do, a few case studies. This one I had you read uh, for this week. It's about human challenge studies. So actually deliberately infecting healthy people with a pathogen to see how their immune system responds because they'd be given like a medicine or a vaccine or something, right? And they talk about what well, this, this, the benefits of this could be that it speeds things up. Think about Gene Hackman and his questionable research, right? in the movie clip. Well, if you really give people the pathogen, you can really quickly see how well your medicine is doing. Now, no surprise, here too, we have the same bad history of vulnerable populations being manipulated and abused and exposed to these risks against their will. But that they say shouldn't mean, doesn't mean that all human challenge studies are bad. It just means you have to have certain conditions in place, especially free and informed consent, right? So they can be acceptable as long as we meet basic research ethics requirements. And that's a hyperlink. And if you click on that, you know where it takes you? The Declaration of Helsinki, which we talk about in our book. But look, all you really need to know is the Declaration of Helsinki is kind of an international Belmont report. You know, Again, the Belmont report for the US lays out these ethical principles by which to judge the ethical acceptability of a human research uh, experiment. The Declaration of Helsinki 
more or less does that sort of thing on an international scale, okay? And I just, the other thing I want you to note from this as you're reading this article is that really they're just, they're essentially using this Belmont framing. Once you know that framing, you can see bioethicists like, like these guys using it when they think about different case studies. So they say, first, of course, you have to have the informed consent of the people you wanna do a challenge trial on. Although Gene Hackman, again, from the movie would say, do you always need that, <laughs> right? Sometimes isn't there such a great rush or a great need that you might not even necessarily need to get somebody's informed consent? It's something to think about. Um, and then you need to think about beneficence, which just means, again, the weighting of risks um, and benefits, right? So you've got to think that through. And then they also talk about uh, developing countries and how they might have different pathogens going on there than developed countries. You might even have different immune responses in people in developing countries. And so actually justice, they say, might require us to do challenge studies in developing countries, right? which seems maybe counterintuitive at first, but they make uh, an argument for that. So keep those things in mind as you look about that and kind of put it in this bigger picture. I couldn't resist this though, because there, there's just so many cases we could talk about. Uh, and I know you get sick of listening to them, Adam and Akbar and our, our talking head box, but just real quick, uh, indulge me. Look, in the news now, as I'm recording this October, 2020, the coronavirus vaccine, you know, we've been talking about this. Look at this headline from New York Times. I won't be used as a guinea pig for white people. This is an amazing story about communities of color being suspicious, as they say, not of the science so much, but of the scientists. And if you look at the history, including and especially the Tuskegee study, it's no wonder there is a trust problem going on. This is a story about how it's about one pastor in his attempt to get people in his community to participate in vaccine research trials and then ultimately getting the vaccine because that's important because the coronavirus has disproportionately affected communities of color, right? So if you want, I'll link this in your notes. It's really fascinating to read through. This stuff is alive today and very important. Um, in terms of how we think through, again, informed consent, risks and benefits, and justice in terms of who's exposed to the risks and benefits of new um, drugs and vaccines. The other thing on the right side, if you've ever read this book, um, or even just Google HeLa cells or Henrietta Lacks, fascinating story. This is a story of a woman, I believe in the 50s, who went in uh, with a medical problem and it turns out she had a form of cancer uh, without her knowing it, okay, without any informed consent, in other words, the doctors harvested cells from her body. And it turns out this cell line, HeLa, which comes from Henrietta Lacks, these HeLa cells became a massive multi-million, I don't know, billion dollar commercial success because these cells were so good at replicating under all sorts of conditions that the biotech industry that was growing after the 50s and now into today could really use those for all sorts of applications. So her body was actually the source of this massively economic, uh, massive economic engine, right? But she never saw a penny of it. She didn't even know about it. And her family had to learn about it just through some side channels. And then this story is about how and, and whether and to what extent they should be able to profit from the cells that were collected from her body without her knowing it, right? Amazing story. Um, okay, but that's enough. Back to that first point, Amanda, why are we talking about this anyways? Well, because humans ultimately have to furnish knowledge about humans. You wonder, well, if you look at Akbar's quote here, is that always going to be true? Might we be on the cusp of generating, for example, such, such powerful computers that you could just plug the chemical uh, formula for a given medicine that you want to develop into the computer and it would spit out uh, an outcome that would tell you whether it's safe or not to use. And you wouldn't have to put it in anybody's arm. 
or you think more fancifully, uh, we could develop artificial humanoids of some sort that would replicate all of our physiology, but wouldn't be moral beings in the way that we are. I don't know what they would look like. So maybe someday all of this, all of these ethical dilemmas will be rendered moot because we're gonna tech fix our way out. I don't know, something to chew on. Okay, enough from me. Uh, you know, until next time, may the force be with you. <laughs>